a lot of sort of thing to give yourself those. You know, you know you never. Oh, what's that? Should we pack it up? Dad uh, was a. Uh, he made cakes. So we always had sugar through the war. Uh, she ended up doing a lot of jobs because he left when I was three. He decided that was enough of that. And uh, so she did any down home job she could get to feed and clothe me. I was raised by my auntie. My father and my mother split when I was about four. I spent some time with my mother up till about four. Then I was brought up by an auntie. My mom was a nurse. She was a midwife as well. And my dad was a cotton salesman. My mother was um, from an Irish family called French. And uh, she had lots of brothers and sisters. My grandmother used to live in Albert Grove, which was next to Arnold Grove. I was terrible at school because I didn't spend much time there because I was also very sick as a kid. I had uh, peritonitis when I was six and a half, which is, just means burst appendix and you, you're gonna die. And they said to my mother, you'll be dead three times, but here we are, we're still here. My dad was a musician, amateur musician, and uh, he would play piano around the house. We always had a piano. And I've got some lovely childhood memories of sort of lying on the floor and hearing him play. When my parents were younger, they used to have to listen on an old crystal radio set, sometimes known as the Cat's Whisker. When I went to art school, I was at art school for five years. When I went to, this was sort of college, you know, I went in there, they would only allow jazz to be played. You know, they wouldn't allow rock and roll in, it was frowned upon those days. So we had to con them into letting us play rock and roll there on the record player by calling it blues, you know. Whatever record was being played, you'd try and listen to it. You know, you couldn't even get a cup of sugar, let alone a rock and roll record. There was no such thing as an English record. You know? I think the first English record that was anywhere near anything was Move It by Cliff Richard. And before that, there'd been nothing. I remember being in school when I was a kid, and uh, somebody had a picture in one of the musical papers uh, of Elvis. I think it was an advert for Heartbreak Hotel. And I just looked at him and just thought, he's just so good looking. He just looked perfect. When I was 16, Elvis is what was happening. A guy with long, greasy hair, wiggling his ass and singing Hound Dog and uh, That's All Right Mama and those early Sun records, which I think are his great period. That's him. That is the guru we have been waiting for. The Messiah has arrived. <laughs> Suddenly, here was a rock and roll hero who had glasses. about doing music as a way of life until rock and roll hit me. And then when rock and roll hit me, that changed my whole life. Drums were the only thing I wanted. And I came out and I used to look in shops and see drums. That's all I looked at. I never looked at guitars or anything. My dad used to be a trumpet player himself. And for my birthday, he once bought me a trumpet from Rushworth and Drapers, one of the music stores in uh, Liverpool. And then uh, when I was 16, I re-established a relationship with my mother for about four years. She taught me music. She first of all taught me the banjo, and from that I progressed to guitar. She, the first song I learned was Ain't That a Shame, an old rock hit, Fats Domino. Uh, when I was 13, 14, I used to be at the back of the class drawing, trying to draw guitars. Big cello cutaway guitars with F holes, little solid ones with pointy cutaways and rounded cutaways. And, you know, I was totally into guitars. And I heard about this kid who had a guitar and it was three pound 10. It was just a little acoustic round the hall type guitar. And I got the three pound 10 off my mother. That was a lot of money in those days. But I suddenly figured out that I wouldn't be able to sing with this thing stuck in my mouth. So I went back to the shop and traded it in for a guitar. I was about 16. I bought a 30 bob bass drum, 30 shillings. Huge mother, just a huge one-sided bass drum. It's a joke in the family, guitar's all right for a hobby, but it won't earn you any money. In fact, you know, sometimes we'd travel the whole of Liverpool just to go to someone who knew a chord we didn't know. Um, remember once hearing about a bloke who knew B7. Now we knew E and we knew A, 
it was quite easy, but we didn't knew B7, we didn't know B7, that was kind of the missing part of the link, the other chord, the lost chord. So on we got on the bus, trooped across Liverpool, changed a couple of buses, found this fella, and he showed us dum, 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 B7. We learned it off him, got back on the bus, went home to our mates and went, zing, got it. Yeah, Paul and I used to just kind of get together, played a bit, but it was, we were just schoolboys then. There was no groups involved till a little bit later. You know, they say beggars can't be choosers. And we were just desperate. You just get anything, whatever what? film came, right. you'd just try and see it. George and I live very near each other in Liverpool. So in fact, we were just a bus stop away from each other. I get on the bus. And then the stop afterwards, George would get on. So being quite close in age, we'd sit together and we'd talk about stuff and that. Um, in fact, he was, I think, about one and a half years younger than me. That's quite a big age difference at that time. So I suppose I used to talk down to him a little bit, as you do to a sort of kid who's one and a half years younger than him, when he's sort of 14 and a half and I'm sort of 16, you know. It might have been a failing of mine to tend to sort of talk down to him because I'd known him as a younger kid. He was always uh, nine months older than I. Even now, he's still nine months older than <laughs> me. Paul met me the first day I did Bebopalula live on stage. And a, a mutual friend brought him to see my group called the Quarrymen. I had a mate at school who was called Ivan, Ivan Vaughan. And we were born on exactly the same day in Liverpool, so we, we were great mates. And uh, one day he said, do you want to come to the Wilton Village Fete? So I said, yeah, all right. So we went along one Saturday afternoon. I remember coming into uh, the field where they had the fete, and just a bit over there, there was a wagon, uh, and on the back of this, or a little stage or something, on the, on, up on this stage, there was a few lads around, and there was one particular guy I noticed at the front, had a sort of checked shirt, sort of blondish kind of hair, a little bit curly, sideboards, looking pretty cool. And he was playing sort of one of these guitars, guaranteed not to crack, you know, not a very good one. But, um, but he was making a very good job of it, you know, and I remember being quite impressed. And he was doing a song by the Dell Vikings called Come Go With Me. And the thing about it was, he obviously didn't know the words, but he was pulling in lyrics from blues songs. So instead of going, uh, come little darling, come and go with me, which is, the, is right, he'd then go, down, down, down to the penitentiary. And he'd be doing some little stuff he'd heard on big Bill Brunsey records and stuff. So I thought, that's clever. That's, the, he's, he's pretty good. That was John. And we met and we talked after the show. And I, I saw he had talent and he was playing guitar backstage and doing 20 Flight Rock by Eddie Cochran. I was the singer and the leader. Well, I made the decision whether to have him in the group or not. Was it better to have a, a guy who was better than the people I had in, obviously, or not? And that decision was to let Paul in to make the group stronger. And I turned around to him right then on first meeting and said, do you want to join the group? And I think he said yes the next day. I said, well, I've got, I got, I've got this friend who's, who's really good, you know. And they said, well, yeah, like what? You know, I said, well, he can play raunchy perfectly. And we all love that song. So we said, well, got to, got to try him out. Remember, we ended up on the top deck of a bus, empty, late night bus kind of thing, and just us there. And he said, go on, George, get your guitar out. Go on, you show him, man. I thought, you know, and he got it out. Down, 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 sure enough. No perfect, raunchy, you're in. was John's friend mainly from art college. Stuart was a very good painter. We were all slightly jealous of John's friendship. John being a little bit older, certainly than me, certainly than George. He was a little bit, you know, uh, he wanted to sit next to him on a bus and stuff like, he's the older fellow, you know, it's just the way it was. Now, so when, so when Stuart came in, it was a little bit of a sort of, he was sort of taking a little bit of that 
position away from us. We so I had to take a little bit of a um, back seat. The famous stories were he sold his painting to John Moore exhibitions and all that. So the question was, what do you do with 75 quid? So we said, you know, that happens to be the exact amount it takes to buy a Hofner base, and that'd be a great thing to spend the money. I said, no, no, I'm a painter. I've got to spend on paints and such like, you know. We said, no, Stu, really? And John and I kind of gave him quite a sort of persuasive argument that the best thing to do, obviously, was to buy this Hofner base, <laughs> which he did. He went and did that. And the um, only trouble was he couldn't play it. But it was better to have a bass player who um, couldn't play than to not have a bass player at all. When we started off, um, we had a manager in Liverpool called Alan Williams. He was a great bloke, a real good motivator. He was very good for us at the time, you know. And he, he eventually got us an audition that was held at one of his clubs called the Blue Angel. And um, it was for Larry Parnes, who had a big stable, so-called, of rock stars down in London. We eventually got the audition. I think Larry picked up quite a few Liverpool groups at that audition. As a record, you know, this is us at the audition. This is something for Larry to take a look at or whatever. And we always, unfortunately, had to ask Stuart to sort of turn a little bit away from the camera. We'll say to him, look, don't go. Because as he couldn't play that well, we might be in A and he might be in A flat. And we thought someone would spot this because we always looked, see where people were on the guitars, see where they so we'd ask him to sort of turn away a bit. So there are a few photos of Stuart you know, moodily with his back to the camera, you know. That was the reason there. But anyway, that was, it was a pretty pathetic tour. By the end of it, we were broke, we had no money, we were all cold and freezing and, you know, just miserable and, and that was it. You know, we all came back to Liverpool and nothing happened, really. We didn't really know. I felt really sad because we were like, orphans or something. We didn't have it. Our shoes were all full of holes and our trousers were a mess. And we didn't have uniforms, you know. And we were crummy. The band was horrible, you know. We were really an embarrassment. We didn't have amplifiers or anything. So uh, I would say to the others, when they were depressed, or we were all depressed, you know, thinking the group was going nowhere and this is a shitty deal and we're in a shitty dressing room, I'd say, where are we going, fellas? And they'd go, to the pop piano, in pseudo-American voices. I say, where's that, fellas? And they'd say, to the toppermost, the poppermost. I say, right. Then we'd all sort of cheer up. And then we had all sorts of different drummers all the time, because they, people who owned drum kits were far and few between. It was an expensive item, and they were usually idiots, you know. We got Pete Best just because we needed a drummer the next day to go to Hamburg. He came down to the. Jacaranda Club. We did a quick audition with him and jumped in the van and went to Hamburg. Everything else was such a buzz, you know, being mm. right in the middle of the naughtiest city in the world at 17 years old. It mm. was kind of exciting. And learning, you know, about, well, there's all the gangsters and there's the transvestites and there's the, you know, it was like that, there's the hookers. At that time, we were just kids let off the leash, really, come straight from Liverpool to Hamburg. And we were used to these little Liverpool girls. But by the time you got to Hamburg, if you, if you got a girlfriend there, she was likely to be a stripper. She was the only kind of people who were around at the time we were around late at night there. So, I mean, you'd... For someone who'd not really had much sex in their lives before, which none of us really had, to be suddenly involved with a sort of hardcore striptease artist who obviously knew a thing or two about sex um, was quite an eye-opener. In Hamburg, because we had to work six or seven hours a night on stage with no rest, the waiters always had these pills called preludin. And so the waiters, when they'd see the musicians falling over with tiredness or with drink, they'd give you the pill. You'd take the pill, you'd be talking, you'd sober up. You know, you could work almost endlessly until the pill wore off, then you'd have to have another. I think that's where we um, found our style. We developed our style because of this fellow that he used to say, hey, you've got to make a show for the for people. I used to come up every night shouting, Mac Shao, 
So we used to max shower and John used to dance around like a gorilla and we'd all, you know, knock our heads together and things like that. Ringo was a professional drummer who sang and performed and had Ringo star time and he was in the one of the top groups in Liverpool before we even had a drummer. Well, Rory and the Hurricanes, they were the first ones in Liverpool who really wanted to get into rock and roll. By the time we all met up in Germany, they were playing one club, we were playing another. Um, they were just great by then. And I used to like, because we used to do long hours, we used to do 12 hours at a weekend between two bands. Uh, when we ended up on the same club. And I, so if they had the last set, I'd sort of be semi-drunk and demanding they play slow songs. We made friends with a lot of people. There was, um, the ones who became our real friends were the ones who, like, who are known now as Klaus Bormann, Jürgen Vollmann, and Astrid, mm -hmm. who took all the famous photographs of us at that period. I was 17, and when we first went out there, and we went to the Indra Club, and then got moved to the Kaiser Keller, and then that ended up with us getting the gig to go to the Top 10 Club. And right before that happened, I got busted for being underage. Now, they had this kind of situation in Germany, which I'd never come across before, which was a curfew. Um, and after 10 o'clock at night, anybody who was under 18 had to get out. And I was only 17. I was sitting in the band, and I kept, started getting worried. And eventually, somebody found out we didn't have any work permits or visas. So they started closing in on us and uh, the police came one day and then they just booted me out. Well, Paul and Pete got, uh, you know, deported and um, by the police for burning the condom on the wall. And uh, so they were back before me and John got back about two days later. I was really happy, you know, thinking, oh, great. That, and then that's what the support of nature, you see. And Stuart just stayed there because he decided to get the rye hearted with Astrid. So the second time we went back when I was 18, that's when we were backing up Tony Sheridan. And at that point, this fella came into the club who was, they said, oh, he's this famous record producer and musician. He was called Bert Kempfert. And his claim to fame was he had a number one hit in America. Not only was he a record producer, but he had a hit in America called Wonderland by Night. It was just kind of turned out to be a trumpet sort of solo, but he came in the club and remember this buzz went around, we've got to be good, play really good, we may get a chance to record, which we did. I think he came back two times and then he said, oh, I want you to come in the studio with Sheridan and record. And we got all pleased with ourselves. And then we got to the studio and he just wanted us to like back up Sheridan. While we were out there, we started to see other groups and stuff and started to get a little bit dissatisfied with Pete. Not massively, but just a little bit of dissatisfaction started to creep in. I seem to remember him, you know, starting to not turn up for gigs and then we kept getting Ringo in. Ringo Starr, who had changed his name before all of us and who had a beard and was grown up and was known to have a Zephyr Zodiac, which was a very big car in those days, you know. I mean. Nobody had this. It was knockoff, probably. It was, you know, it fell off the back of a showroom. But <laughs> <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> Ringo kept sitting in with the band, and every time Ringo sat in with the band, it just seemed like this was it. And this happened three or four times, and then that was the end. You know, we were just pals, and we'd have a drink after it, and then be the Finch. I'd be back with Rory. And around about this time, Stuart and I got a little bit fraught too. See, because. I claim that what I was trying to do was make sure we were musically very good. But this did create a couple of rifts, and I can see now how I could have been more sensitive to it. But who's sensitive at that age? Certainly not me. Well, when we first met him, he couldn't play at all. When, I mean, when he first got a bass. Uh, and he learned a few tunes. Occasionally, it was a bit embarrassing. He didn't, you know, if it had a lot of changes to it, he was... But he knew that too. That's why, you know, he was never really that at ease being in the band. And that's why he left when we finished the gig in Hamburg. He decided mm -hmm. to go back to art college. 
At that point, Paul was still playing the guitar. And I remember saying, well, one of us is going to be the bass player. And I remember saying, and it's not me, I'm not doing it. And John said, I'm not doing it either. He went for it. And then we went back to Liverpool and got quite a few bookings. You know, they all thought we were German. You know, we were builders from Hamburg. And they all said, you speak good English, you know, <laughs> things like that. So we went back to Germany. We had a bit more money the second time. So we bought leather pants and we looked like four Jean Vincents. Only a bit younger, I think. John put this thing in um, the Mersey Beat, right, which was also started by Bill Harry, who went to art college with John, just saying that uh, this little guy appeared on a flaming pie, you know, in the sky and said, let there be Beatles, with an A. So anyway, we did well at the cavern and uh, attracted some big audiences. And the word got around. What had happened was a kid had gone into Brian's record store and had asked for my Bonnie. And then he found out that the Beatles were supposed to be a Liverpool band and they were playing the cavern. So he went down the street and, and checked us out. Because I remember Bob Wooler, the disc jockey, saying, and we have a Mr. Epstein who owns Nems Enterprises in here. And everybody was going, ooh, wow, you know, big, big deal. <laughs> This was quite a new world, really, for me. Uh, I was amazed by this sort of dark, smoky, dank atmosphere, this beat music playing away. And um, the Beatles were then just four lads on that rather dimly lit stage. Amongst all that, something tremendous came over. And uh, I was immediately struck by their, their, their music, their beat, and uh, their sense of humor, actually, on stage. And even afterwards, when I met them, I was struck again by their personal charm. And uh, it was there that, really, it all started. You know, he said, yes, you might as well. Straight away, he got us some jobs, got us a bit more money, and um, then started getting us radio shows and things like that. And then, you know, as we go ahead, we got into our suits. You know, he talked us out of the leather suits. Yeah, I remember we had to drive down to London on uh, New Year's Eve because we did a session for Decca, you know, an audition for Decca. So Brian then had this tape which he hawked around. And I think it was somebody in the HMV shop on Oxford Street knew George Martin and told Brian to go and play the tape to George Martin. And then he gave us the audition at um, Abbey Road. George had done little of you know, no rock and roll when we met him and we'd never been in a studio. So we did a lot of learning together. He had a very great musical knowledge and background. Um, no, I, I think they, they had tremendous charisma. I knew that that alone would sell them. And we did a reasonable audition, not very good. But the thing he didn't like was our drummer. And I said to Brian Epstein, if when we do the next session, I mean, I don't want to interfere with the Beatles and what you're doing with them, that's fine. But I'm going to provide the drummer. We really started to think we um, needed the great drummer in Liverpool. Historically, it may look like we did something nasty to Pete, and it may, it may have been that we could have done it better. But the thing was, as history also shows, Ringo was the, the member of the band. It's just that he didn't enter the, the, the film until that particular scene, you know? Love, love me do. Their first record did very well. It sold 100,000 copies. That was Love Me Do. And Bob Waller got on the stage. Telegram in his hand. I've got news for you. And it looked terrible. We thought, you know, something disastrous has happened. And he says, the Beatles record, please, please me. It's reached number one in the national charts. And the lads themselves just stopped and looked at him. You know, they thought he was joking. He must have been, you know, that was Paul. He must be joking. And there, there were lots of people who didn't know the Beatles. And they all started cheering and clapping. And there were about three rows of girls at the front, and every one of us started crying. It was a terrible night. You know, we knew then, they'd get famous and they'll go away and they'll belong to us no more. 
you can be big headed and say, yeah, we're going to last 10 years. But as soon as you've said that, you think, you know, we're lucky if we last three months. You know. From that moment onwards, they blossomed. They, they became wonderful songwriters. But before they showed evidence of that, I still had to have an album out. And so what I did was, I mean, I'd, I'd been up to the cavern and I'd seen what they could do. I knew their repertoire, I knew what they were able to perform. And I said, let's record every song you got. Come down to the studios and we'll just whistle through them in a day. So we were just trying to improve all the time and we'd listen to something that somebody else had done and we'd just try and beat it a bit. We'd try and beat what we were doing. And I mean, by the time we got to something like From Me To You, it was nice because the, the, I remember being very pleased with the chord in the middle, which was different from what we'd been doing. Anything that you wanted, anything. Then he went. Just that. Oh, so going to that minor chord there it was like, ooh, you know, this is something we hadn't done before. I got arms that long to hold you and keep you by my side. In the early days, we'd make a record in 12 hours or something. And they'd want a single every three months, and we'd have to be writing it literally in the hotel or on, in a van. The demand on us was tremendous. I remember sitting on a pair of twin beds in a hotel bedroom, had a day off, so we were going to write a song. All our early songs had always had, please, please, me, from me to you, P.S. I love you. We always had this very personal um, thing, thank you, girl. And we hit on the idea of doing a kind of reported conversation. I saw her yesterday. She told me what to say. She said she loves you. So it just gave us another little dimension, really. It just meant that the song then was something different from what we and other people had written before. I have it from a reliable source that a half million advance orders have been made for the Beatles' latest single release, She Loves You. It looks as though it could well be three number ones in a row for the Liverpool boys. And it was great, you know, we were kings and we all, you know, just at the prime and we all used to just go around London in our cars and, and meet each other and talk about music with the animals and Eric and all that. And we were very close to the Stones. We were always kind of you know, a little nervous before each step we went up the ladder. Mm. We were a little nervous, but we always had that confidence. And, and that was a good thing about being four together, not like Elvis, you know. I always felt sorry later for Elvis because he was on his own. He had his guys with him, but there was only one Elvis. Nobody else knew what he felt like. But for us, we all shared the experience. You were treated differently. And you had to get used to that then. Then you, you know, you found yourself in in a weird land because of all these people you've grown up and lived with. Suddenly you, it was the one place you didn't want it to change because it all changed out there. And you were never secure really who your friends were unless you had them before. You know, people are so in awe of fame. I mean, all you have to do is go on the radio or the television once. And if somebody sees you on that and then they see you down the street, they act different, don't they? But the Beatles was have been on the papers every day for a year or so. Everybody changes, you know, they're so impressed by it. And they, people forget how to act normal. Today, the Beatles return from Sweden to be greeted by what the British press are calling Beatlemania. We'll see what the Queen Mother thinks of Beatlemania when the Beatles perform at the Royal Variety Show on the 4th of November. With the Beatles was the first kind of put together album of, of first songbook, so to speak. And they gave me a list of their songs, and and they were all thinking in terms of singles. Still, um, we weren't thinking in terms of an album being, uh, you know, a piece of an entity by itself. It was a collection of songs, and all we did was to record singles, and uh, or and the ones that weren't too good we wouldn't issue singles, we'd put them on an album, which is what, with the Beatles. The Beatles' second LP, with the Beatles, has broken the record for advanced sales of an LP. With the Beatles has an advance of a quarter of a million. The record was previously held by Elvis Presley's Blue Hawaii. 
Brian Epstein could well be right in his prediction that the Beatles one day will be bigger than Elvis Presley. I think one of the cheekiest things we ever did was say to Brian Epstein, we're not going to America till we've got a number one. And the reason we did that, we'd seen a lot of people like uh, Adam Faith, Cliff Richard, British stars, quite big stars over in Britain, go over to America and be like third or fourth on the bill to people like Frankie Avalon, who we didn't really respect, or Fabian and people like that, who were a little bit sort of one-hit wonders to us. So we thought that's the kiss of death, is to go over to America and, you know, come down in your career, really, and take a, take a downward step. So we didn't want to do that. For, so for some reason, we just said to Brian, right, we're not going to America till we've got a number one record. We were trying to get in America all the time. I really thought She Loves You would have broken the American. But if you think of our frustration here, um, we were being turned down by the company, which EMI actually owned. And I was so frustrated by this, I, I said, well, if they're not going to let us, if they're not going to put it out. I mean, in the case of From Me To You was the first one we, we offered them. Um, we'll, they can't deny us other people putting them out. So I would then take the record back from them and try and get it out with another label. And I did negotiations with Swan and with VJ, each of whom, very tiny labels in the States, took one or the other titles. And they put those records out in America. And of course, being small labels, they didn't make a great deal of, uh, of, of um, success. And that was the way it worked out. We released uh, Please Please Me, flop. From Me To You, flop changed record labels, released She Loves You. They'd all been big hits in, in England, all been number one. All of them flops, nothing. But by this time, the news from England and Europe was overwhelming that they were a hit group. And they had to take them more seriously than they'd done before. And also, they were, the Swan and VJ labels were making inroads. They were selling by this time. Mm -hmm. So Capital were forced to release I Want to Hold Your Hand. It wasn't designed specifically for the American market. But like the ones before it, it was a great record. We got a telegram um, in the evening after one of the shows when we were having a drink at the hotel. And it, ca it came a uh, Capitol Records, congratulations lads, number one in US charts or something. So we all hit the roof. I remember riding around on Mal Evans' back for about 20 minutes or so. Yay! And he was, you know, happy to burn me. It was just very high. Uh, hysterics, you know. And Brian rang me uh, around about half past one in the morning. He said, I know you won't mind being woken up. I said, well, I wasn't asleep anyway. He said, well, I've just heard from America. We're number one. John, so far, all British pop stars have not made a tremendous impact on the States. How do you think you're going to fare? Well, I can't really say, can I? I mean, is it up to me? No. I mean, I just hope we go all right. You know? No ack ack greets this invading plane arriving at New York City's Kennedy Airport, but the pandemonium created by the 3,000 teenagers on hand to greet the sortie of Britain's bristling beetles is something one might expect from a collision of planets. Liverpool's contribution to American culture is something that, to say the least, sparks many diametrically opposed reactions, which starts at the Beatles' first press conference. Hello, John. Hello, Brian. What, what are your first impressions of arrival in America? Oh, I don't know, the sort of... the wild. <laughs> They're all wild. They just seem to go... Wilder than they are here in England? Well, it seemed like it. Maybe it's just the first impression here. Yeah, they just seem... All my love These youngsters from Liverpool, England, and their conduct over here not only as fine professional singers, but as a group of fine youngsters will leave an imprint with everyone over here who's met them. Hey, let's go. But nobody ever sort of made it in America, and we were dying to be the first. A lot of people had tried and failed in America. We were just very confident, and just the uh, confidence was at an all-time high, you know? I thought we'd conquered America. I mean, we, it was sort of an attitude we had, OK, we've conquered Sweden, we've conquered France, yes, America was ours now. The next few minutes are in the lap of the gods and the hands of the Beatles, which means anything can happen. We're going to hear sort of versions of uh, yes. songs from their film. Film, yeah. Who was worse? 
Oh, Paul. I see. <laughs> I think John was about the worst. Oh, Ringo was very good. He was, he was. He's a good lad, yeah. They're saying he's a new he was Charlie mine. Chaplin. You, think... you say you will love me if I have to go. All together, I think it's 30 days. There's just more people here because they're bigger stadiums. We normally play in theatres in England. I should think that last year you visited more countries than ever, isn't that right? Uh, yes. 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 Oh, yes, been Ooh, away. Many. Which has been your, your favourite one that you visited? America, I think. Yes, I'll agree with that. Ringo agrees with that. Mm -hmm. Why, in particular? Because you make a lot. No, no, because <laughs> no, it's good, you know. It's, it's like Britain, only with buttons. I see, Button? yes. That's a sort of abstract suit. It's a sort of, uh, yeah. Well, there's more people, you know, in America, so, so you get bigger audiences and it's all wild and happy. I remember once when we were going to go back for the second uh, tour of America and they were saying, oh yeah, we're going to start in San Francisco with a ticker tape parade. And that was once when I actually did say, you know, I'm not going. I'm not, I'm not having a ticker tape parade. You know, I mean, it was only, it seemed like a year as since they just assassinated Kennedy. And um, yeah, I could just imagine, you know, this, how mad it is in America, you know. No, it's just so much fun. If I fell in love with you, would you promise to be true and help me understand? Cause I've been in love before and I found that love was more than just holding hands. If I gave I will probably never do another tour like it, you know, it could never be the same as this one. And it's just been, you know, probably something we'll remember the rest of our days. And most of the boys' songs today are taken from their latest LP, which is called what, Paul? Called okay. Beatles for Sale. All of them. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's got eight right. of our songs, and the, the rest are, the rest, eight from 14, what's that, nine? Please. That's six. Too bad. <laughs> I'm not very good at counting. Six, so I see. six, six of course. Four, yeah. Six, yes. Who's, Eight and six. How many is... GTs? <clears throat> well, I didn't get that one. Who, uh, counting. Didn't get counting. Who are the other numbers? Kansas right? City. Two Carl one. Perkins, Two one Carl... Little Richard, one Chuck Berry, no, and one <laughs> Dr. Feelgood. And that's the, that's the rest. What's the Chuck Berry? One of the problems with all their concerts was that they couldn't hear themselves. Everyone's used to the, today to the technology in great concerts, and everyone has a a fold-back speaker at the, their feet so they can hear what's going on. Didn't have that in those days. So the, the three, uh, John, Paul and George, will be standing at microphones in front of a screaming crowd of 60,000 and Ringo will be at the back on the drums. And Ringo said to me, you know, he said, it was very difficult following, he said, I couldn't do anything clever, I couldn't do great drum kicks or anything, or drum rolls or, or fills, so I just uh, had to hang on to that backbeat all the time to keep everybody together. <laughs> You know, I need someone. We'd done the Hard Day's Night uh, film, which was great, and uh, Dick Lester had done this kind of slightly artsy black and white thing that I think we'd all loved. So the next thing was, OK, well, what do we do now? Well, maybe a colour film. In colour, yeah, wow. They see they had more money for that one. So then things went a little bit uh, awry, I think, because what happened then was people were sort of giving up the drink which had been the sort of stimulant of the times, and we're getting into the herbal jazz cigarettes. Um, and it was changing things a bit, you know, things were becoming a bit more imaginative, a little more crazy. By then we were smoking marijuana for breakfast at that period, and we were well into marijuana, and nobody could communicate with us because it was just four glazed eyes giggling all the time, you know, in their own world. We had fun in those days. And I think that was one of the reasons for not learning the script. We just sort of showed up a bit stoned, you know, and sort of smiled a lot and hoped we'd get through it. I enjoyed filming it. You know, I'm sort of satisfied, but not smug about it. You know, it, it'll do. We couldn't do it any better than that because we're not capable act enough actors to make it any better than that. I know that we were searching around for a title, and that was always a kind of crucial thing to us, you know, to get the titles good and that. John got the idea, I think, for the title help. And I think from things he said later, I think it was a bit his state of mind, you know, he was feeling a bit constricted by the whole Beatle thing. 
He never said that when he wrote it. He said it retrospectively. That was how he was feeling, and that's why he wrote that. Um, but he was kind of plump and, um, and you know, he had his... He, I think that he just didn't feel right, you know? I mean, I go into these troughs every few years. It was less noticeable in the Beatles because the Beatles' image and thing would carry you through it, you know? I mean, I, I was in the middle of a trough in help, you know? But uh, you can't see it really. I mean, I'm, sing I'm singing "Help" for a kickoff, you know. And but it was less noticeable because you you're protected by the the image of the power of the Beatles. I used to live in this uh, little flat up at the top of a house uh, in a little room I had, and I had a piano by the bed, and I just woke up one morning with this tune in my head, um, and I thought. I don't know this tune, or do I? It's like an old jazz tune or something, and because my dad used to know a lot of old jazz stuff. Well, maybe I've just remembered it or somewhere. So I sort of got, went to the piano, found the chords to it. You know, it was like in G, F sharp minor, seven, sort of B and that. And um, I kind of re just remembered it, made sure I remembered it. And then I just hawked it around to all my friends and stuff and said, well, what's this? You know, it's got to be something. It's like a good little tune, you know, and I couldn't have written it because I just dreamed it, you know. You don't get that lucky. And it wasn't until he got the lyric together that we, he decided to record it and he said, how should we do it? I said, well, it's a lovely song, super song. I can't really see what Ringo can do on it. I can't really see what heavy electric guitars are going to do on it. Why don't you just go down there and sing it to me with a guitar? And we'll decide what to do with it then. And it was good, actually, because all the others, uh, the guys, I looked at them like, oops, I mean, you know, solo record. And they said, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter. There's no, nothing we could add to it, so do it. This is a form of protest to the Queen because this order is being debased by everybody in giving this to um, uh, people who are not deserving of it. If I had the MBE, I think I should be slightly put out at being placed on the same level as a pop singer. How do you feel, John, about having the MBE? I feel great, you know, it's, it's, we're honoured. <laughs> I thought it was really thrilling that, uh, you know, we're going to meet the Queen and they're going to give us a badge. I thought, you yeah, know, this is cool. We were standing in the line, waiting to go through. It was an enormous line, you know, hundreds of people, and we'd been grilled by the guardsmen saying, this is what you do when you get up there. And then we were so nervous that we went to the toilet, and in the toilet we smoked a cigarette, because we were all smokers in those days. But years later, I'm sure John, thinking back and remembering, oh yes, we went in the toilet and smoked, and it turned into a reefer because, you know, what could be the worst thing you could do before you meet the Queen is smoke a reefer. But we never. It was like this whole momentum was going, you know, that had been going for years and it just kept rolling. You know, now we were playing stadiums. You know, that was in the days when people were still playing f the Finsbury Park Astoria, you know, and to play at Shea Stadium. I never felt people came to hear our show. I felt they came to see us. Because from the counting on the first number, uh, the volume of uh, screams well, just drowned everything out. Vox made a special big amplifiers for that tour, and they were like 100 watts. <laughs> we went up from the 30 watt amp to the, the 100 watt amp. Let's go. I feel fine. Baby's good to me, you know she's happy as could be, you know she said so. I'm in love with her. Well, it was marvelous. It was the biggest crowd we ever played for. It was the biggest live show, I think, anybody's ever done, yeah. they told us. Yes, sure And it was fantastic, you know.
They were um, finding new frontiers all the time. They were becoming more and more uh, productive, and the work they were giving me was much more interesting. Well, by this time, the Beatles were really into experimenting. They loved working in the studio. The studio was their refuge from the mad world outside of concerts and, and fans and, and pressures and interviews and so on. In the studio, they could be themselves with me, and they weren't interrupted, they weren't bothered by anybody, and they could do what they wanted. And they had this eternal curiosity for new sounds. And they were always coming to me and saying, what can you do to give us a new sound? But during that year, towards the end of that year anyway, I kept hearing the name of Ravi Shankar. I heard it about three times. And about the third time I heard it, it was some friend of mine um, who said, oh, have you heard this person, Ravi Shankar? And so it was around that time I bought a sitar. I just bought like a cheap sitar in a shop called India Craft in London. They were trying out new instruments and always coming to me saying, what, what ideas have you got for this, you know? I don't see too much difference myself in rubber sole and revolver. To me, they could both be like volume one and volume two. Um, maybe I'm wrong, I haven't played them right back to back of each other, but they both were very pleasant and enjoyable records for, for, for me. I mean, it has that quality because, it, you know, it's the follow-on and we were just starting, I feel, to really find ourselves in the studio. You know, where, what we could do, which was, you know, over just being the four of us uh, playing our instruments and, and the vocals. And their ideas now were beginning to become much more potent in the studio. And they would start telling me what they wanted, and they would start um, pressing me for more ideas and more ways of translating those ideas into reality. Um, I didn't have too many songs. They were more or less the ones I'd written. I've always had a couple of ones I was working on or thinking about. And later, in the later years, I did have a huge backlog, but in the mid 60s, I think, you know, I, I didn't have too many. Well, I think George went through the same problem I went through first of presenting his songs. Uh, but, you know, that didn't really last long. Uh, and then he started coming up with great songs. And it was on Revolver that, of course, we have the track Tomorrow Never Knows, which was uh, a great innovation. That's me and my uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead period. And the expression Tomorrow Never Knows was another of Ringo's. So I gave it a throwaway title because I was a bit self-conscious about the, the lyrics of Tomorrow Never Knows. So I took one of Ringo's malapropisms, which was like Hard Day's Night, and sort of to take the edge off the heavy philosophical lyrics. When we took the notorious wonder drug LSD, yeah. it was, uh, we didn't know we were having it. John and I had, the, had this drug, and it was given, we were at, having dinner with our dentist. Yeah. And he put it in our coffee and never told us. And we'd never, we never heard of it. I mean, it's a good job we hadn't heard of it because there's been so much uh, paranoia uh, created around the drug that people now, if they take it, they're already on a bad trip before they start. Mm -hmm. Whereas for us, we didn't know anything. We were so naive and uh, so we had it and we went out to a club and it was incredible. Something like a very concentrated version of the best feeling I'd ever had in my life. It was just like fantastic. I just felt like in love, but not with anything in particular or anybody, just with everything. Just everything was perfect. And we walked and things weren't the same that night as they'd been. It was all this Alice in Wonderland stuff was going on, but strange things. The quote which John Lennon made to a London columnist more than three months ago 
has been quoted and represented entirely out of context. I mean, early in 1966, John gave an interview to Maureen Cleave, do you remember her, at the Evening Standard, in which he made a chance remark saying, we are, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus Christ. You know, but I'm not saying that we're better or greater or comparing us with Jesus Christ as a person or God as a thing or whatever it is. You know, I just said what I said and it was wrong or was taken wrong and now it's all this. The repercussions were big. I mean, there was particularly the, what they call the Bible Belt. The Beatles made a statement in all the newspapers that they're getting more better than uh, Jesus himself and the Ku Klux Klan being a religious order is going to come out here the night that they appear at the Colosseum here and we're going to demonstrate with uh, different ways and tactics to stop this performance. The Klan is going to come out here because we're the only organization that will come out and make a stop to these accusations. This is nothing but blasphemy and we're going to try to stop it any terror way we can, but it's going to stop. We're known as a terror organization. I think we have... A terror organization? We have ways and means to stop this if uh, this is going to be the case, yes. Uh, what, uh, what ways and means? Well, I don't want to say this, but uh, there'll be a lot of surprises uh, Monday night, I believe, when they get here. Just the general Beatlemania was, um, you know, it took its toll. And also because we were seeing it then from as no longer as, like, uh, naive kind of, you know, just on the buzz of, of our fame and success, you know, by this time, I mean, the dental experience had, you know, had kind of made us see it from a different light and it was no longer fun anymore. I don't think anyone didn't want to stop touring. Probably Paul would have gone on longer than George and I. But you'll have to ask Paul about that. Oh no, you know, touring's good and it keeps us sharp and we need touring and musicians need to play, you know, I'd keep music live, I'd been sort of a bit that attitude. Well, finally I agreed with them, you know, and it was like, oh, you were right, you know. I think it was George and John who were particularly against it, uh, particularly got fed up. We might have been waxworks for our, for our, you know, what the good we did there. You know, nobody heard anything, or not even, you know, a basic beat, I don't think. They were too busy tearing each other up. We were just tired, you know. It had been, uh, how many, four years for us of legging around, you know, screaming in this mania. You know, we were tired, we needed to rest. By the time we got to Candlestick Park, I think we'd, we knew now, yeah, sure, you know, this wasn't, uh, this wasn't fun anymore. I think that was the main point. And, you know, we'd, we'd always tried to keep, you've got to really try and keep some fun in it for yourself in anything you do, you know? And we'd been pretty good at that. We'd enjoyed touring, and we'd enjoyed doing a bit of TV, we'd enjoyed Europe, we'd enjoyed America. Wow. But now even America was beginning to pale, you know, because of these conditions you've mentioned, and the fact that we'd done it so many times. So by then it was like, yeah, well, don't tell anyone, but this is probably our last gig. Yeah, see, there was big talk at Candlestick Park or that very period about, you know, this has got to end, this is it. Mind is in a maze, what can I do?